think that talk from Alan is one of the best talks I've heard for a long time in Lagos, because I've been to so many meetings over the last 18, 20 years that I've been looking for phlebology. And I've had several articles in the Daily Mail, I've been on television, I've done everything, saying we've got to treat Lagos as differently. Because in fact, although the level one evidence, as Alan says, has just come out, the evidence has actually been here since 1990. And I'm going to be a little bit more hard-hitting than Alan, because everything he said is absolutely right. But in fact, public is moving faster than we are as professionals. So Ellie asked me to talk about the challenges and barriers related to wound management of the lower limb. This is who I am, Mark Whiteley. I'm a sort of venous surgeon, very important, not vascular. Vascular means arterial. And the, all the people who are vascular surgeons, the arterial surgeons, they are experts in aneurysms, carotids and bypasses, and they're not interested in venous disease. And how do I know? Because I lecture all around the world on venous disease, and I always meet the same two doctors from the UK. No one else comes. And all these people you see about called vascular surgeons, they don't go to venous diseases. I was actually asked at venous conferences, I was asked to give a talk at the BSET, which is British Society for Endovenous and Endovascular Treatment. And in two and a half days, there were two talks on veins. Mine on superficial veins and one other on deep veins. And when I got up to talk, almost everybody left because it was lunchtime. And I just stopped and I said, is anybody interested here in venous disease and varicose veins? And one of the guys from the front said, well, no, not actually. He said, because it's only varicose veins, isn't it? And I said, oh, that's fine. So about the 40 or 50 people still there, I said, can I have hands up? Who here does varicose vein surgery? So everybody put their hand up. I said, who does it privately? Almost everybody put their hand up. I said, how many of you are interested in the talk? And nobody put their hands up. because it was doing. And I said, imagine if your patients were here knowing that you are actually operating on them and not even interested. And that is why if you work in hospitals or you see varicose vein, or even, God forbid, you've had your varicose veins treated, unless it's by one or two of us who do the perforators, look at the pelvic veins, keep up with all the latest stuff, the stuff you've had is at least 10 to 15 years out of date. And the UK, if the trouble with our NHS, and we all love the NHS, but if they don't train somebody in a speciality, it doesn't exist. And phlebology doesn't exist. You don't have phlebologists. Where are they? If you say phlebology to most people, they think it's the person who takes blood. That's phlebotomy. So the trouble is, venous disease, ha any idea how many people are affected with venous disease? It's 70% of people. If you look at hemorrhoids, that's venous, pelvic congestion, varicose veins, leg ulcers, congestion, all these things, because we stand up, we have venous disease. And yet nobody's interested in it. 30% of women who have pelvic pain go to gynecologists, get told they're mad, nothing wrong with them, or endometriosis, they've got pelvic varicose veins. If you go onto the Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists website, in the whole list of causes of pelvic, uh, pelvic pain, nowhere are veins mentioned. So 30% of women in this country with pelvic pain never get diagnosed. I've been kicking on about ulcers for ages and ages and ages because the papers, as I show you, came out in the 1990s and at last people are starting to take it on. And this is going to have huge ramifications because, as I say, the, the solicitors know about it and as I'm going to show you, the patients know about it now as well. And so we, it's not shall we change our pathways, it's if we don't, we'll be dragged through the courts. So these are all the different things I've done in my past. I set up a charity on leg ulcers several years ago. That's where I met Ellie. Um, College of Phlebology, this is a worldwide thing for doctors and nurses who want to learn more about veins. I've written one book. It's very simple, just an introduction, edited another, etc. And we've got over 120 peer-reviewed papers. But in the UK, I'm hardly known. Worldwide, I'm paid to go around and talk about veins. It's just because of this problem we have. And what, what's the problem? The problem is leg ulcer care is changing. Alan's absolutely right. It's, it's changing. It's got to change more. Than, and the trouble is, we as a country are ignoring the research. And what's worse, we're ignoring the guidelines. Once you ignore guidelines, that's when the solicitors get in, as you see Judge Rinder. I was going to put Judge Judy, because I like her better, but, <laughs> but she's American. So <laughs> but the, and the trouble is, as in so many areas of medicine and nursing, sometimes if we don't take the lead then we get forced to because of medical legal problems. And it's a real problem. I, I give, have been giving lectures for 16 years on how to treat leg ulcers, and I can't get GPs to turn up. The biggest audience I've had is four. And I'm giving a talk in November, 
And because of what I'm about to show you, I changed the title from leg ulcers to the medical legal consequences of not treating leg ulcers. And it sold out in two days. <laughs> it's absolutely, if you want to scare people witness, just say medical legal. It's the only way people listen. This is sad, isn't it? I'm going to tell you about two cases that I'm currently involved in, unfortunately, where the GPs are being sued, and this is really worrying, the district nurses are being sued as well. They're not, usually it's the overriding doctor, now it's not, you're independent practitioners, and I'll show you, and also dermatologists. So the first patient, you've heard some of this lady before, if you saw us talk, uh, Susan Osler, who's my uh, leg ulcer specialist nurse, and myself who presented this lady. So you might have seen some of this before, or those moved on. This lady, Janet, she's quite happy not to be anonymous. She's 69 years old when she turned up. She had 20-year history of varicose veins. As Alan said, half the people with varicose veins can't see them, okay? You can't see them. You can't see you haven't got them. And that's what I termed hidden varicose veins in 2009, and luckily it's taking off. Before that, it was called complex things like superficial venous reflux, and it's quite opaque. Now we just call it hidden varicose veins. This lady even had them, so she knew they had them. Even her father had been wearing compression hosiery. She, we knew it was familial. She developed her ulcer on her right leg in 2013, and she needed a hip replacement on the left. But she couldn't have that because the surgeons wouldn't do it with an open ulcer, as you'd expect. And she was a carer. These are the services she used in the four years that she had an ulcer that didn't heal. Dermatologist, she even saw a vascular surgery, but as I say vascular, as soon as you say vascular, think arteries, it's not veins. Tissue viability nurses, orthopedics, day case, practice nurses, GP, physiotherapists. Susan Osler here did a fantastic job, and what she did with the Freedom of Information Act, she went back to the GP surgery to find out how much you as taxpayers spent on this lady, okay? And she's actually, these are all the products. This isn't just made up for, for effect. <laughs> these are all the products that this lady had in four years' time, okay? Now, our colleagues in industry, there are, without doubt, an awful lot of patients who need these products. But we've got to find out the ones who don't. It was 25,000 pounds on products alone, plus the nursing hours, which we couldn't uh, manage, plus all those others. Estimate about £75,000. Now, your taxpayers, that is money that has come out of your pockets. More importantly, your nurses, and that is £75,000 you can't spend on people who need it. So when everybody's moaning about resources, also think about wasted resources. Because this is this lady, as you'll see, was a total wasted resource. Because she found about our work on the internet, she referred herself to my clinic, we did the usual, took a hist medical history, did a duplex ultrasound scan, which is the thing that in the 1980s came in and totally changed venous practice. She had endovenous laser, foam sclerotherapy, which I'll go through a little, bit, a little bit of compression afterwards, and we discharged her to liaise with the community nurses and leg clubs. By the way, nothing I'm saying is anti-leg club, because this has got to be coordinated through you. And there are people who don't, as Alan said, it's about taking the people we can cure out of the system for the increase of resources in the air. So don't think this is an aggressive thing. This is the duplex. Now, you may not have seen a duplex before. And um, I, when I see my patients, <laughs> I always say to them, the more biro, the worse it is. So, so <laughs> I think you can see there, there's a little biro. But basically what this is, this is the vein starting from the ankle to the hip. And the O's mean normal, and the X's mean the valves are given way and the, the refluxing. Okay, and there's nothing blocked. But most importantly, if you look at the middle veins, the upside down Y, the deep veins, it's normal. No DVT, nothing, but there's nothing there that's incurable. That's only varicose veins. She's got a great saphenous vein, the one that starts from the ankle and goes to the groin. By the way, if anyone says long saphenous vein, they haven't been to a vein meeting since 2001 when we changed the things. So if you ever see a duplex report or a doctor say long saphenous vein, which most still do, they haven't been to a vein meeting since the Rome Convention 2001, which is a real worry. Um, and if you see, she's got an 18 millimeter great saphenous vein. It's meant to be three millimeters. Okay, so not only is it massive, but it's also letting blood fall the wrong way. So if you imagine 100 mils of blood started her foot and should get back to her heart, about 20 mils of it is falling back down her leg. Not surprisingly, when the next lot of blood comes to the heart, that means that she's got 120 mils to pump up. So the deep veins swell, everything swells, and she gets a swollen leg. And if it's gone long enough, you get a leg ulcer. Plus, she's got these eight perforators. Now, I keep on being told by my vascular colleagues that you don't need to treat perforators. Utter rubbish. 
utter rubbish. Randomized controlled studies for elsewhere show if you don't treat those perforating veins, there's almost no point. It's actually got nine holes in a bucket. You're lifting it up, nine holes it's leaking out. And if you only treat the main vein, which most people think is the venous, you've only plugged one of those nine. So in any case, she came in. This is her timeline. That's when we saw her on the left-hand side. Um, she had an EVLA uh, in December. As you can see, the ulcer is virtually the same, a bit cleaner because uh, I think Susan scrubbed very hard. But, um, but no, no real change to the ulcer. But then look what happens between December and February. The effect of just the laser, already the granulation tissue is looking great and stuff. No, it's not dressing, it's not compression. She had some maintenance. This is by changing the hemodynamics on the inside because her deep veins were good and she's walking. By that time we did the foam in March, went on by May, completely healed. Okay, completely healed. This lady is now out of your care. She doesn't even need a stocking. No compression at all, no maintenance, nothing at all. She then went on and she had her hip replaced. How much did it cost her? Because of course, she didn't get funded for it. She had to actually take out a loan to pay for it herself. The total cost was 5,446 uh, pounds. Now imagine, uh, we're private practice because we can't get any government funding. We have to go on private insurance, so we have to get research grants where we can or company support. But that is less than one year of dressing, and she's now cured. Unfortunately, well, fortunately, she had her hip replaced, went back to normal life, but unfortunately, she decided to sue for four years of pain and discomfort. And I asked her not to. I said, please don't sue. And she said, why wouldn't I? Because doctors and nurses do not listen if you don't sue them. And I said to her, if I go down, I take a day off, I don't get paid, I only pay if I work because I'm private, I don't have a nice contract from the government. And I said, if I take a day off of my own time and I go and teach the doctors and nurses in your, in your GP practice and they change, will you not sue? She said, no, that's fine. So I took a day off, I went down there, arranged it, we got some sandwiches for everybody. I gave it all, everybody gave the talk about how to change it, which I'll show you in a minute. And at the end of it, they shook my hand and said, that's really, really nice, it's fantastic, glad you're doing so much research. Of course, we're not changing because we're very happy with our protocols. So she phoned me that night and said, how did it go? I said, I'm really sorry, they're not changing their protocols. She's now suing. She went to the NHS solicitors who have given her permission to sue. And this is the really important thing, the doctors, because on two occasions they didn't refer her to the vein surgeons, and the nurses, because they had 70 points of contact with her in four years, and they didn't pull up the doctors and say, actually, the doctor should have referred you. And so the nurses, as independent practitioners, are now being sued as well. I don't know if it's going to be successful. It's one thing to say you're going to sue, but the fact that the NHS has given her permission to, and also I've spoken to some things, she's almost definitely going to win. Okay? There's 300,000 people like her in the UK. That's a, it's the next PPI if we're not careful. This is an even more worrying study for me. This guy we've never presented before because um, it's this year. He's a young man. He's only 30, excuse me. He's only 34 years old, and at school he was called Snake Boy because he had a varicose vein on his foot in his lower leg. And as you know, kids are cruel. 1998, he left school, um, he had aching legs, he wanted to be a waiter. We all know that if you're standing long periods of time, your veins get worse. It doesn't cause varicose veins. Remember that standing does not cause varicose veins, but if you have varicose veins, it makes them worse. So it's not a cause, but it worsens them. 2007, he started noticing brown staining. Well, we all know where that's going if we've been in the venous world. What that means is you've just left it too long and it's going forward, and then he developed leg ulcers. But he was too young to have venous ulcers, according to his doctors, which is rubbish. I've already treated a 19-year-old with venous leg ulcers. It's just how bad your veins are. So in any case, he got diagnosed as pyoderma gangrenosum, had a biopsy which was negative. So people scratch their heads. They said it's probably a venous ulcer, but they just did the dressings compression. They did the continued 2013, um, and they got to temporary healing. And remember, if you heal with compression, and as Alan says, you haven't treated the underlying veins, it is only a healing, it's not a cure. They will come back, the Eshkar study shows it. 2013, these ulcers returned, and the dermatologist said the biopsy must be wrong, it must be pyoderma gangrenosum because you're young, and they gave him high-dose steroid, prednisolone 40 milligrams. If those of you have used steroids, that is a massive dose, and kept him on it for eight months. Because of that, it thinned his bones, he broke, he had crush fractures in his spine, he had to have surgery to operate on it. He was then told he must have some sort of resistant um, problem, it must be autoimmune, so they gave him chemotherapy for seven months. 
still had his ulcers. He's, of course, putting on masses of weight because of the steroids. He dislocated his knee, had to hear pain clinics. He found us, and he basically said, what can you do for me? And once again, that was his ulcer on the right-hand side. With, was, that was a very, very good picture because he had such good compression. But look at his duplex again. Deep vein's normal, so he's curable. If the deep veins are normal and you can move your ankle, you are curable. And his great saphenous vein, 9 millimeters, small saphenous vein, 5 millimeters, and his couple of perforators. So not surprisingly, he had endovenous laser, followed by foam, the same thing again, the Whiteley protocol is developed. And look at that, by the end of by August, completely healed. Okay, completely healed, no compression at all, no maintenance because his hemodynamics are working. He's now at the gym, he's running 10 kilometers a day. He had a small DVT because of the steroids, but it luckily cleared straight the way through. But this is all, as Alan said, local anesthetic walk-in, walk-out treatments. He's now suing his dermatologist for unnecessary steroids, unnecessary chemotherapy, osteopenia, the thinness of the bones, loss of earnings and pain, and he will win, okay? This is the problem we've got, and this is why I'm being a little bit harder than Alan, because I'm afraid I don't think there's time to sort of go away, scratch our heads, think about it, because any patients you've got who aren't being referred at any time down the line, I do, do you know how long it is after the medical or, or medical or clinical negligence people can sue? Does anyone know how long it is? It is three years from the time the patient found out they can sue. So in 20 years' time, if they're at a dinner party and said, oh, by the way, I had a leg ulcer, I didn't get referred, they've got three years from that date. So in other words, there's no limit. So this is why this is important. And I'm really sorry to bring the medical legal stuff into this, but it is so important for our futures. So what is, what's changed? Um, I think it's very easy for us to stand up and say, oh, it's veins. And unless you're in venous surgery the whole time, I'm sure, you know, to you, that's just squiggly stuff on the inside, because most vascular surgeons think that as well. So what I do is, in my books and in when I teach, I try to make things as simple as possible. I'm not talking down to you, because I'm dyslexic, and it's the only way I remember things. And if you look at this here, this is all my books, and everything I ever show is the same format. That heart-shaped thing at the top is the heart, and the th bottom is your ankle, okay? And what happens, why vein surgery is magical, it's all about how to make blood or water run uphill. It's totally against gravity, okay? So we have these little things called valves. If before the 1990s, it was believed by doctors and nurses that when you stood up, blood falls down the big vein in your body called the inferior vena cava. And if all the valves are work working, you don't have a problem. But they used to think that if the valves went in your superficial system, you got varicose veins, and that was cosmetic. But if you went down your deep veins, you got leg ulcers, and the only thing you could have is compression. That's what we were all taught. And most people still think it's true, and it's utter rubbish. But that was what we were taught, and it was meant to be easy. What changed it? It changed it. First of all, people started doing this little thing called handheld Doppler, which now is only useful for ABPIs, as you'll probably all know. But no, that can't tell you anything about veins. Because when you stick it in a, on a vein, you don't know which vein you're listening to. So nowadays, you have to use venous duplex ultrasound, which gives you a picture of the vein with ultrasound and shows you the flow inside it. I'm very fortunate that when I was a junior doctor, venous ultrasound just came in, and so I've grown up with it, and my whole career has been based upon venous ultrasound. And the first thing we found is that when people come in and tell us that their varicose veins are really annoying them and they want to get rid of them, the varicose veins are not the problem. The varicose veins are only the sign on the surface of the underlying condition. You're probably aware, aware now, but it was for quite a long time, patients were really shocked when they said, I've got a varicose vein on my calf, and we say, yes, we're going to operate in your groin. And they'd say, well, why are you doing that? And of course, you know, you all know that it's the great venous vein. But patients found that hard to believe. Now we've found that actually the varicosities aren't actually even the problem. It is that underlying reflux. And it's actually the new endovenous laser treatments we now use. So what's changed in the 1990s, and this goes right back, the earliest, page, the earliest papers on this were actually 85, and 92 is when it was actually first published, that if you look at the people who have got leg ulcers, and you scan them, they've only got superficial vein disease, in other words, hidden varicose veins, in 60% of cases, and that means they're curable, and only 40% of the patients had deep vein problems and needed compression and are incurable. So there is a section of people who are, but that's been known since 1992. And when I published my paper on 85% cure rate of leg ulcers and 52% um, not needing any long-term compression, I published in 2012, and that was my 12-year experience. So we might now have level one evidence that's just out, 
But when it comes to suing and when it comes down to what should doctors and nurses know, I'm afraid the papers were all coming out in 1992. And the rest of the world, when you have a leg ulcer, you get referred to a venous surgeon within two weeks. And when I go to Germany and when I go to the Netherlands and I say we're fighting for it, they laugh at us and just say, oh my God, are you really that far behind in a first world country? And it's a problem. So t the take home message for this is approximately 60% of leg ulcers if new presentations on people who fit and well and can walk, so those are all the provisors because you have to be able to pump if you fix the veins, are curable with these new techniques. Of course, if you're not pumping, if you're not able to stand up, if you can't walk, there's no point in fixing the veins because this only works. The veins only work if you can make them pump afterwards. This is really important. In 1986, Skirn and Coldridge Smith published this uh, study and they got some of the best vein surgeons of the time and they actually stood people up in front of them they, with all different sorts of varicose veins and leg veins and said, What's the, is this person got varicose veins? Are, you know, is this important? Is this not? What would you operate? And if you just look at a leg and try and do it clinically, you are only right 33% of the time. So what you can say as a very experienced nurse or doctor is you can say, you have got a vein problem. I can see you've got it. You can never say you haven't because it's hidden away in over half the people. And you have to have, you don't have a venous duplex ultrasound done by a proper vascular technologist, not a doctor who's bought his own one and doing their own quick one, because that's been shown to be wrong in at least 30% of cases. And nice guidelines say no doctor should be doing that. You should only have a scan by a vascular technologist who does nothing but vascular technology day in, day out. The same way that if you go to a hairdresser, you don't want someone who's actually a gardener who does hairdressing on a Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> you all know it and I know it, okay? Just, you've got to think of this, it's, it's a 10,000 hour rule. If you don't do something all the time, you're not expert at it. So to see perforated pelvic veins, you've got to have a venous uh, ultrasonographer who does this all the time. Do that and you can find then what's going on. But never tell someone they don't have a problem unless you've got a reputable ultrasound that says it. Because otherwise you're open to being told you're wrong. So what is it about, um, I'm just trying, trying to make sure I don't overrun because this coffee is important in life. So the, what's important, the, my little book I wrote uh, uh, down here on understanding venous reflux is all about just understanding the basics because the basics in veins are fantastic. Arteries are easy, they're really easy. You've got a pump that pumps at high pressure and it shoots blood down to the other end and that's it. And the only things that can go wrong is the bit in the middle can dilate and explode, an aneurysm. You just repair it or they die. Or, <laughs> I, I didn't mean that nastily, of course, but that's sort of the outcome. Or it narrows or blocks, in which case you open the narrowing or bypass. It's not, it's not rocket science. You stand up and the gravity works with you. I should never say it's not rocket science, by the way, because I work in Surrey, and a, the, the University of Surrey does do rocket science. And I once said to a guy, it's not rocket science. He said, actually, I'm a rocket scientist. And it's, not, it's, it's not that hard. <laughs> so, so I, I'm going to get another, another phrase for that. But it's not that hard. So what's difficult, what's really difficult to understand is vein disease. How do you get blood to run uphill and stay uphill? And the truth be told, I spend my whole life in vein disease, and we still don't fully understand how it works normally. So when it starts going wrong, anyone who says, oh, this doesn't work, or that does, they're lying. Because no, none of us on the research side truly understand it, never mind how it goes wrong. So we're getting there. What we do know is by the time the arterial blood has gone through the system and comes out of your capillaries, you've got 15 millimeters of mercury in your feet, and you've got zero in your heart. And so when you're lying down, not surprisingly, blood goes back to your heart, leg ulcers get better. If you want to test if your leg ulcers are arterial venous, the simplest thing, put them in bed, elevate, and watch what happens over a couple of days. If it's venous, it gets better. If it's arterial, it gets worse. Venous leg ulcers only worse than when you've got gravity as well. And that's because when you stand up, that 15 millimeters of mercury only gets the blood back to the, to the ankle. To get it back from there, you need two things. You need valves and you need movement. You know more about movement than I do because basically I don't see patients who can't move don't come and see me because I, if they phone and say, should I waste my money came to see you? I say, can you move your ankle or you walk? If they say no, I say, don't bother. I can't fix a pump if the pumping bit's broken. So I'm not talking about movement. That's your speciality, is not mine. What I'm talking about is the valves and the valves very simply are, they are passive. There's nothing clever about them. If you've got a duffel <coughs> coat, that little pocket on the side, that's like a valve. Hold it like that. As blood goes up, the valve gets pushed into the coat as blood falls down, it opens up. So there's no muscle, there doesn't have any energy, it just either works or it doesn't. And when it's competent, blood goes upwards when you pump, and when it, when it tries to fall down, the two little valves open up, 
and it stops. And that's called a competent vein. That vein is working properly. So you walk, it ratchets up, all the valves close. <coughs> ratchets up, and blood goes back to your heart. It works really well, especially when you don't think of it as one leg, but you think of it as two, because your legs, as you're walking, work in tandem. That gives you like a cylinder pulsating effect. So all your valves are pointing either inwards or upwards. And not surprisingly, therefore, all the blood flow in the veins should be inwards or upwards, or upwards and inwards. That's the only way it goes. Any time a valve fails, that is reflux, that is incompetence, and that's where we get the problems. And this is one of the things I like doing. Now, those of you who came to my talk last year in the little um, areas, I used to say, do you like James Bond best or do you like Ferraris? Because the are, it's the same. But I'm going to choose for you this time, and I'm going to say, right, this is uh, James Bond, because of all the thing in the bodyguard recently. So what happens is, when, you, when James Bond goes into a place to kill someone at night, he, puts a, he goes in with his gun, he aims at a person, shoots, big bang, everybody goes running, he gets arrested. Well, we know that doesn't happen. What does he really do? He goes in, he's about to shoot someone, he puts a silencer on the end, and he goes, and you don't hear it, and he gets away. And the reason he gets away is the silencer, and of course, if, if I chose a Ferrari, it's the silencer on the exhaust. A silencer is a thing called an expansion chamber. And what it does is it takes the pressure, it takes the, it takes the energy away. Now, when you stand up, you get this tidal wave of blood running down your incompetent vein. If you've got varicose veins, that is a silencer. All the energy ends up in the varicose veins. And so you end up with this incredibly low profile of energy, and you don't get any damage. And that's why people with massive varicose veins rarely have leg ulcers, because the varicose veins actually are protecting them. And any doctor who comes along and takes away those varicose veins has made it worse. And that's why when you do varicose vein surgery, the patient says, look at these veins here, and we don't care about that. We look for the perforates, we look for the pelvic veins, we look for the underlying veins, treat them first, and as an afterthought, do the ones on the surface. Because if you do the ones on the surface cosmetically, you're making it worse. And the chapter in my book actually is called Varicose Veins, The Good Guys. Because they're the things that actually, if you're a gardener and you've got calloused hands, they're the calluses. They're the things that are stopping you getting injured. The body's always working to stop you getting injured. If you're unfortunate enough not to develop varicose veins and you've got the hidden varicose veins, every time you stand up, blood shoots straight down, no silencer, bang, you get this huge amount of inflammation in the ankles. And this has been proven. If you actually lie someone flat and take a blood sample at the ankles, and then you stand them up and take a blood sample and lie them down again, the blood sample shows a massive increase in inflammation when you stand up. It's the same as someone kicking you. Every time you move, it's just like having a little kick on your ankle, a little kick, which after 20 years gives you a leg ulcer. The treatment is to stop the little kick. It's not to, it's not to push on the leg ulcer. It's to stop the little kick. So if you can find that little kick, that's what you have to do. More difficult to understand, and this is why we need phlebologists, because the last bit vascular surgeons can understand. What they don't understand is this bit, and that is if you've got valves above you, so in other words, as perforators, how does it work? because there's no flow down if the valves are working above. And the way this works is this different mechanism called active pumping, which I won't go into deeply, but basically what happens, it's just like having a squeezy bottle, squeezing it very, very hard. You think how far up you can get the blood. Now drill a hole between your fingers and do the same thing. So the reflux, when it comes to these sorts of veins, is different. And that's why most doctors don't treat them, because they do the wrong test, because they don't actually measure during the squeeze. That's a bit more complex, but it still is venous reflux. This is another major problem we have. Um, most of you, like me, were probably taught there are two main veins that cause varicose veins or problems in the body, and they're called the great saphenous vein and the small saphenous vein, or if you haven't been to a venous meeting for the last two decades, they're called the long and short saphenous veins. Unfortunately, what duplex has shown is those are not the only two veins by a long way because you also have the anterior accessory saphenous vein, which by itself can cause leg ulcers. You have bifid great saphenous veins, you have bifid small saphenous veins, you have Giacomini veins. You have at least 150 different perforators above or, above or below Lee. And of course, one in five women with varicose veins have pelvic vein reflux. And that's actually coming the same way. If, you, if people worry about pelvic vein reflux until you suddenly talk about boys. All of you have probably heard about varicose seals in boys. But well, if you're a girl, you've got a varicocele, not around your testicle, around your ovary, but because it's inside, nobody believes it's there. You imagine how many, how many operations are done every year on boys' varicoceles. We all know there's loads. Every single one of those is mirrored by a girl who has an ovarian varicocele. That's how common pelvic 
congestion syndrome is a pelvic disease. But because it's on the inside, nobody cares. When you add all the different areas that you can cause have venous reflux, there's over 160 different veins that can cause reflux, that can go on to cause leg ulceration, eczema, and all the other things. And so when you have a doctor who's bought their nice little uh, duplex and they sit in the field or now patients say, I'll do a quick duplex, are they really looking at 160 veins in each leg? And we all know the answer to that. A duplex never takes lo less than 15 to 20 minutes per leg. And if, it's, if there's something wrong, it takes longer. So a five-minute duplex, I'm trying to get the insurance companies just not to fund it because it's a rip-off when doctors hold it and say, oh, I think it's your great venous vein, and that's it. You know, it's just a nonsense. So what are the causes of venous leg ulcers? So again, I'm not talking about all the different ones that you treat I'm talking about where they can't move and can't do it. This is the, but this is a true venous leg ulcer where the patient is able to walk. In those, you've got superficial vein reflux on the left there, great venous vein reflux. You've got perforators. You've got a combination of the two. You've got deep re venous reflux and superficial venous reflux and perforators, and you've got deep vein reflux. Now we can close these veins with endovenous laser, radio frequency, all is walk in, walk out, and foam sclerotherapy. We can cure the perforators and we can cure the superficial vein reflux. If your deep veins are working and you can walk, we can cure you and absolutely get rid of that ulcer. And those people, they can come and support and help, but you don't have to spend any more money or time on them. And you can put the resources to those people who really need it. We can improve the ones that have got deep vein reflux and superficial, because we can take some of the reflux away. In the past, we used to say that if there was deep vein reflux, you can't treat it. And that is now wrong. Because obstructive disease, if it's in the pelvis, and you have these, you quite often see these varicose veins across the pubic area. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. But if, the if they've had lots of DVTs in the past and they've got an obs a blocked vein in the pelvis, it can now be stented. And this is a huge thing. It's done almost all around the world. And there's a few people now doing it in England. They're seeing black up in London. Um, David Beckett down in Bournemouth are making a huge thing. People who haven't been able to walk because of venous claudication for 20 years, you can put one of these stents in. In fact, David put one all the way, stented both groins up to the renal veins, stents all the way up. And the patient went from being able to walk 50 meters, and he now runs five kilometers every day. Legos has disappeared, um, big, brawny, brown legs back to normal size. So with these, if they hadn't had the scan, you wouldn't have known that. So you need to have a scan, but of course then it's got to be a proper scan by someone who knows what they're doing, and it's then got to be seen by someone who knows what they're doing in veins, which is why I want more doctors to get into phlebology. The third cause, so we've got reflux obstruction. This is the one that we can't get round as surgeons. This is what you are experts in, and this is stasis. And just to put this into the science side, so you really understand what you're doing, you've got the artery side coming into the capillaries, and a normal group will then have the blood flowing up through normal veins afterwards. If you lose those valves, right, or you can't walk, and the blood comes down, the stasis causes that blockage other end the capillaries. The capillaries don't work. That's why you don't get good nutrition to the skin. It goes down other things which are called shunts. Not surprisingly, when you've got stasis, all you can do is compress it, elevate it, physio, maybe pump stimulating, but you've got to get rid of that stasis, maybe foam sclerotherapy, etc. And so that's understanding your venous leg ulcers, understanding, because once you know it's only stasis, nothing else, there is virtually nothing else you can do unless you do some foam sclerotherapy, but you've got to do the physio, you've got to do the encouragement, the nutrition, all those other things. Those are the patients you have to throw everything at. The aims of the new techniques. Uh, so as you just heard from Alan, these are all now walk in, walk out. People literally walk in, there's no sedation, they're local anesthetic only, they walk out. Um, people, when it first started coming in, when I, I was the first person in the country to do it, we just came up for our 20th year anniversary, I'm about to go in the newspapers and all the usual thing, and everybody in the Venus world, vascular world, hated me. They all said, oh my God, it's private. And as soon as it's private, people stop listening. They forget that there's some very good research that comes out of the private sector if people invest in it. But what we found is with this thing called venous closure, through a single needle hole, you can pass the catheter up inside the vein. You can then burn it. Nowadays, you can use radio frequency or lasers like these if you're out of date. Most people in the UK, if you've got your look, they'll be using that stuff. We stopped using it in 2005 because it's rubbish. These are the new ones that are much better. The radial lasers over on in the middle there and the end firing lasers with jackets. With these, you can actually make sure you cure the vein even if it's scarred. Radio frequency, you've got to touch the vein wall. 
So if you've got some clot or calcium in there in a patient with ulcers, it's really hard to close. Laser, you blast through everything if it's a 14, 17 nanometer. And this is what I do in my university. I get my PhD students. We take some veins out from volunteers who, at time of surgery, we put our, the lasers in them. We put all different sorts. There's a culture model there. And then we use immunocytis chemistry. If you look under a microscope at a vein, it looks like a pink blob. You can't tell if it's alive or dead. And all this rubbish that's in the, uh, in the sort of um, uh, world wound care literature and everything saying, well, we think it shows this and think it shows that. You've got to know, it's like having an egg that's living or an egg you've hard boiled. If you, if you look at them under a microscope, it's very hard to tell the difference unless you actually put antibodies in to see is the protein still alive or not. So that's what we do. And you can see here with the red stains, we can see what pattern of vein, uh, what sort of lasers do. You can see the forward firing one kills the inside of the vein, but not the whole wall, whereas the radial, you've got that nice pink all the way through. So we, we spend our lives doing this because we're very boring, but we do love our veins. Um, the foam sclerotherapy is much cheaper. If you do it properly, you don't use air. What you do is you get this horrible stuff that kills veins, and you mix it with carbon dioxide and oxygen so that when you inject it, it's not dangerous. You will see most doctors using air. Air. Just think, would you want air injected in your veins? So it's very easy. You can get a cylinder of carbon dioxide and oxygen. You can mix it up. You can inject it into, and that's what it looks like. Isn't that beautiful? And you can actually see it on ultrasound. So you should never do this blind. On ultrasound, you put the ultrasound on the vein. You put it in. You follow it. You see where it's going. Wrap the patient up. And do not take that wrapping off for 14 days and nights. Because if you've got a dead vein and it gets blood in it, you will get phlebitis. And that's painful. And if you're doing cosmetics, it's 21 days and nights. So any of you, if you, any of you do any work in a, a aesthetic clinics and you're still saying three days, you won't be getting as good results. <laughs> Increase the amount of compression. It's not you as a sclerotherapist who are getting brown stains, it's compression. This is what we now normally expect to see. We expect to see this patient had endovenous laser of a 20 millimeter great venous vein, 14 we uh, 12 weeks later, completely cured. So these people, if they are just superficial venous reflux, you should now be able to totally cure them. Um, what you should know, you should understand veins. If you don't understand veins, you really have to think about, can you diagnose venous ligosa? You've just heard about the Eshkar study. The Eshkar study was very, very important. What the Eshkar study did is it showed that if you treat veins underneath the ulcer, they tend not to come back. In fact, they would have done better if they did perforated as well, but they just did old great venous vein, which grows back. But even using the old outdated methods, you can stop them coming back. What was wrong with this study, as Alan said, the trouble with this study is if they were randomized to compression, they started on the day with compression. If they're randomized to surgery, they were put on a list. So the advantage of how quickly people healed wasn't found in the study because of study design. What they did find, and you've just heard Anne's great presentation on this study, and I, so I won't repeat it all, but you have to know it because it's just out, is the EVRA one. And this is the first time there's absolute randomized evidence that if you don't wait for the ulcer to heal, absolutely don't wait for it to heal, they come in, you do your endovenous surgery through a needle hole. They're not going to get infected. There's no wound. It's just a needle hole. Fix it, and then they go on to get healed. And then foam sclerotherapy or anything else you need afterwards. And that's randomized proof now. And so, you know, the solicitors know it. You have to know it yourselves. So what you know, forget all the little guidelines because what the solicitors and what everybody and what the public are looking at is the NICE guidelines. And unfortunately, when you look up the NICE guidelines, it's not under leg ulcers. That's the real kicker here. You have to look up the NICE guidelines CG168 because this is leg ulcers are a complication of varicose veins. So it's actually called the guidelines on varicose veins. And if you, I don't know if you can read there, but the last two indications, what you must refer to a vascular center, as they call it. We all know they mean venous, but it's not enough. So what you must refer to a vascular center, the last two, a venous leg ulcer, which is a break in the skin below the knee that is not healed within two weeks. You have to refer it. If not, you have broken nice guidelines. Secondly, a healed leg ulcer, a healed one. So if you've actually put on compression and you've healed it and they're walking, but you don't have a check duplex and it opens up again, who's at fault? Now, I'm sure, just to preempt any questions, if anybody's going to ask me about funding, uh, things and everything, please don't ask me. I'm not a politician, I'm a scientist. I don't know is the answer to that. All I know is what's good for the patients. And if we at the ground don't get the patients, and if we as taxpayers don't turn around and say, we want to stop wasting money, we want to cure people, if we don't push it, nothing will change. The, the NHS is meant to be reactive. It's not meant to tell us. Governments are meant to be reactive to the people. So we say, this is the service we need, and then they have to provide it. But if you want to get out of court, 
you need to just make sure that you're making the referrals or showing you're attempting to. And you have to tell your patients, the new law on consent is you have to tell the patients all the alternatives even if you don't provide them. And that's the new consent law since 2015. So the conclusion, the latest challenges and barriers relating to womb, the challenges are education of us. And the reason is because we don't have phlebology as a service. And so you're being taught by companies or disinterested doctors. And let me just give one thing. I know I'm running a little bit, but just I've got a med I, I, every year I take on two or three people who want to be medical students or who are medical students, and I give them research for the summer, and then I, I help their careers along, and they publish, and they go off and become medical students. And they keep in contact. And I've done it for enough years now to have some really nice stories. And one girl came back to me. She's a, um, she's a medical student in a very large town. I better not say where, but she's just finished her medical school, and she got big varicose veins. She came back and said, um, I want you to do my veins. They said, no problem at all. Chatting to her away, she said, I've just qualified as a doctor. I said, well, why didn't you have it done in your local hospital? You know, you're in a teaching hospital. And she said, the reason I didn't is because in five years of medical school, five years, okay, these are the new doctors coming out as your new GPs and surgeons, everything, in five years, one hour on vein disease, and in that hour, they all turned up to the lecture theatre. A young man came in and said, oh, the consultant can't be bothered to teach on veins, so he's doing something else. He's asked me to give the talk to you. I don't really know about it. Let's see what's on his slides. And all the slides said was stripping, 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 post-operative care and stuff. So the doctors coming out of medical school today are still not being tra trained in what medically legally they need to know and for patient care they need to know. So the biggest challenge is not NHS funding, it's not all the things, it's about education, it's about us standing up and saying this is what we need because this is what the evidence shows. And the barriers are people who are not gonna come along on that journey. The people who just say, hmm, I don't think I want to do it. That's the barrier and I totally agree with Alan who just brought this up. And if you're not referring, you're breaking NICE guidelines QS67 which is the quality standard so each each guidance, C CG168, has got a quality standard because if you're not doing it, that's the quality standard you have to come up to. And I'm afraid, as, as my page said, the only way we ever listen is when there's a risk of legal action. Thank you very much.